Pound. <laughs> That's good. Andrew gets his stars. No. All right. <laughs> Thanks for meeting in here today, gang. It's kind of a cool spot, but like I say, we we were initially too big for this room, but it's working out. Everybody's watching this. Justin's going to push a few chairs in. Perfect. It's still be the bill. Yeah. Do oh, want to, do uh, can we just, can you just, be, no, I think that looks good, Justin. I got two in the back. Can you just wheel those to the back because we can't sit people on that side because they can't see them. Yeah. And then you got one there. So we should be totally golden. Thank you. Great. Say hi to Justin, everyone. Hi, hi, hey, we're going we're to. <laughs> just got done with pickers tonight. So. All right. Okay. Good to see you guys. Lots going on in our broken world. I haven't even had a chance to look at the news today with the aftermath of the hurricane. You said it's it was, bad. It wasn't as bad. What as happened? Why it's bad? They didn't have the foot surge. Oh, they didn't have like the <laughs> Oh, they did not have the massive storm surge. I was hoping that it was going to be below Tampa Bay, so it wouldn't be. Yeah. Asked. Sweep it up. And it was well, it was it slightly tough. below ten, slightly but tough. not as bad as they expected. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, boy, I mean that that helps. Mm -hmm. That helps. It gives me opportunity to tell you more about the church, actually. Um, so, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, our national affiliation, I guess you will. You um, and then there's something else called Lutheran World Relief, which I think I already told you about. But we have something called Lutheran Disaster Response. And it's one of the, it's one of those really good where you have ultimate confidence that the money's actually going to help people and not do a bunch of administration. So um, you, we have a deal on our church app. You haven't done that, or you can write an old fashioned check and put in the memo line, hurricane relief. We collect that and we're gonna send out a big check. I think we've raised already 5,000 or something um from special mm -hmm. donations and then we'll send it as a church on um of course you can give individually however you want there's all kinds of things but be careful about those because there's a lot of scams out there um so so anyway so that so and the also something that our national church has is something called elca world hunger appeal and this is a uh, um this does amazing work all over the world and domestically too. So, so there you go. Um, I had this question up there, but I think I'm going to switch. We'll, we'll save that one. Um, let's just, since we're in this nice, more intimate setting, let's just do a, um, uh, a touch in on a high or a low. Okay. Could just be a high that a good thing that's in the last couple of weeks or a low or a prayer concern. So let's just do that. So remind everybody of your name and then do that even though we've got our name tags, which is good. So um, name is Bill. Um, I had a, uh, a, a high and a low. We went down to first my mother-in-law's uh, committal <clears throat> service down in the summit, military cemetery in Central Valley, California. That was, but it was really good to get the whole family together. And some of those, that family won't be able to be up here for the memorial service. So we had a good family time and everything went well. Um, so that that was high in the low boat. Uh, the other quick little high is that we boarded our two doodles, our two go a golden doodle and a burner doodle that we have uh, at Camp Bow Wow or whatever, and they passed the test to be in there. So that was, <laughs> my dogs have not been socialized well, so they did well. So that was <laughs> mom and dad were happy. <laughs> anyway, okay, that's that's me. Uh, let's go this way. Okay. Yeah. I'm Bethany, um, and I had a huge high over the weekend. Last weekend, we went and saw Hans Zimmer in concert. It's a composer who's done like Rise of the Kids, yes. and oh. Prince of Egypt, and Interstellar, and all this stuff. So he's like my favorite uh, guy ever. So uh, that was like magical. And the Lord was there. I'm happy to announce because music is transcendent and yeah. it was incredible. So that is awesome. It was awesome. It was great. Oh, I would have loved that. How did <laughs> yeah. I miss that? Maybe like once in a lifetime thing because um, yeah. 
Yeah, but it was pretty fun. Cool, cool. Yeah, it was in Seattle. Yeah, very cool. Um, my high is uh, we have a visiting um, family member from California for the next couple of weeks. So um, that'd be great to reconnect and spend some quality time with her. And she's come to church and will be coming next Sunday as well. So she's staying with my mom for their presents. So. Um, but we get together and we go and do all kinds of fun things. So I'm just going to find a little popular time to go do that with her. Cool. The next couple of weeks. Very fun. Mm -hmm. I'm Loretta. Um, my time was my uh, husband and I celebrated our 48th wedding anniversary yesterday. And my love was I had a neighbor that I tried to get together with and walk with. I just haven't connected with you. It's not kind of sad. I'm not going to be here. I'm Jim. Uh, we spent, again, a little on his been sick, you know, Sandy had gallbladder surgery and I had cataract surgery and and then we both got cold or something. So it seemed, it seemed like all the pop you've been doing is, uh, you know, the sick thing. But the high, I mean, this, this is, I'm not trying to suck up. <laughs> but, <laughs> but my high is, has to do with, with, you know, stuff that I've learned you know, in this class, and one thing that I think we're even going to talk about tonight, and I've been just, I can't keep myself down. Yeah. <laughs> it it has, has to do with, you know, the Lord's Supper and this idea that we can thank, uh, among others, uh, our friend Mr. Luther yeah. for the uh, true presence of Christ, mm -hmm. you know, in the Lord's Supper. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I, I have a, you know, a, Protestant uh, background, and especially with that, and most of our Protestant friends in you know, different denominations don't hold the view that that Lutherans hold. Yes, we're going to talk about and that. we're, and we're yeah. going to talk about that. But but I am I am just blown away, you know. Like, and it took me a while. Like, are they really saying that? <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I'm Sandy. Uh, my high is feeling well. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's wonderful. Yep. I'm Gary. I had a couple of good eyes. I, I pretty much developed a new friendship and we went out to lunch and then we went shoe shopping and I bought shoes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> The low is my feet are killing me. <laughs> oh, good. Good. All right. Uh, mine is a low that turned into a high because last week I threw my back out at the gym. Mm -hmm. uh, the high is I'm feeling so much better this week. Like it took me a week and mobility and pain level, everything is very manageable. So that's my high this week is just being able to have, uh, be able to move around and be pretty much pain-free. So that's my high this week. And my name is Sarah. And my high has been my birthday was on Monday, mm -hmm. but I started celebrating last weekend and I'm going out of town this weekend for another celebration. And basically I'm continuing it for about another two, three weeks. So. <laughs> but not for you. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm Jerry. Uh, my high is my oldest daughter's coming for a visit for six weeks. She lives in Brisbane, so I don't see her frequently, and so I'm very excited about that. Mm -hmm. She arrives next Thursday. I probably wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no yeah. problem. Yeah. yeah. This is a hard this question a hard for me pretty... this week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm debating whether I should just say skip. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can. Um, okay. Hi is in line with a sermon last Sunday. Um, last week, I'm officially out of an abusive marriage. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. Yeah. Um, low is that uh, about a month ago, he informed our three daughters he's moving to Europe, and this is their last week with him, and they're all having a rough time. Yeah. A really rough time. And my oldest broke her ankle. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, but... I'm going to leave it a high on that. Um, she doesn't need surgery. It, they're treating it more like a sprain. Yeah. So that's a high. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Thank, no, no, don't be sorry. Thanks for sharing that. 
that we will be holding you and them in our prayers. Thank you. Big time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jenny, and um, a low is that last Friday, my husband had a diagnosis that the spot we were concerned about is melanoma. Mm -hmm. um, the high that was very surprising is uh, between last Friday, um, he was able to get a referral to a dermatologist and is having it removed tomorrow. Uh, yeah. which is yeah. amazingly uh, faster yeah. than I definitely expected. So uh, yeah. keeping our fingers crossed and, and prayers that that will take care of it. Absolutely. Good. Mm -hmm. Keep us up to speed. <laughs> yep. Well, Milo uh, came last night, which um, quite unexpected. I lived down in the Scandia Valley yeah. and uh, oh, within uh Quarter mile of us was a double double homicide that took place oh, that night. So um, while not directly affected by it, the valley was uh, for the old timers down mm -hmm. there that have been there for sometimes a lifetime. They've never seen anything like, like that. that. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about the family. I've never seen anybody around the house. Right. I know where it is and all that. But um, so the valley was uh, humming. Uh, yeah, that's a strong, strong, horrible um, trauma. So the high is yet to come on yeah. Sunday. It's been a long time uh, ticket holders for the Seattle Opera. And they have a hybrid coming up this uh, weekend, a premiere of um, uh, Dom's The Story of a Fist College, which uh, um, right after the Civil War, that's a black college, and right after the Civil War, fell on hard times and a singing ensemble from there um pulled together and traveled the country and internationally raised enough money over time to save the college and it still exists today so there's a backstory to the whole thing but it will include something upwards of uh, 30 to 40 spirituals mm -hmm. songs that will come out of the wow. session so looking forward to it it's excellent uh I'm Kenny. I don't know. Every day is a high. <laughs> I wake funny. up and take a deep breath and get to go to school and love it. Yes. Yeah. Enjoy some students. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, uh, I guess a low. Heather's not feeling well. Hasn't been feeling well for a few days. Just some sort of sinus headache and just so that's why she's not here tonight um but uh, uh oh and uh earlier this week uh i was out attempting to dig in our sandbox because the boards are coming apart after 20 years and my neighbors start yelling at me across from the fence and Apparently lost her keys down at Fred Meyer, walked back up to her house, was getting ready to break a window with a rock, and I talked her out of that thinking it's probably just as cheap to break a window as to call the locksmith, uh, but we ended up finding a way into the house. She had a spare set. We went back down to Fred Meyer, and uh, she yeah. had left her wallet and phone and stuff there with her stuff she had bought mm -hmm. but the point of this is that she's basically losing her mind oh, as far as yeah memories though. memory because she she couldn't tell me where her phone and stuff oh, was nuts. but when we got down there she had dumped out her purse looking to see and anyways had left them yeah. there but anyway she called her brother rambled on like I am and and then finally <laughs> told him I need help and he was like we're working on it okay. so as yeah. far as yeah be losing her as a neighbor yeah after well yeah. Heather's been there for over 20 years I've been there for about 15 yeah wow but uh yeah we'll be losing her as a neighbor I suspect yeah. in the next mm -hmm. six months or whatever it takes yeah. to get a place mm -hmm. um, Glad you were there to help her out. 
Yeah, that's what it's about. So <laughs> good, good. Chris, are you able to chime in? Yes, I am. Cool. Uh, my name's Chris. Uh, my hi this week. Uh, last Sunday, I got to go on a nice little Boy Scout hike with our youngest for the Stone Soup hike. So that was fun to do some more, do some scouting activities with him because it's been decades for me and it's fun to see him start getting into it and excited about doing it. And I was able to take a nice little nap when we got back. So I really enjoyed that. <laughs> That's great. That's cool. Cool, cool. All right. Okay. Well, I give you guys all credit because I hear there's a football game tonight. <laughs> it's okay. They're not doing well. They're not doing well. Okay. No, no, don't say any more so we can report we're reporting it maybe now. <laughs> um I have a brother in law that is a massive 49er fan, so that's not good for me. If they know that. <laughs> Although I didn't think they would. Just okay. Show up Sunday with a shaved head. Or yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, I wasn't, uh, didn't get too bad into that. Uh, oh, I love it. Okay. So, um, well, great. Thank you. It's a great check in. Um, we're, we're part of a community here. Um, let's see. That's not where I wanted to start. Screen sharing. That's off. Uh, all right, that's fine. Let me go back to my This and share the screen. I don't know. In seminary, they didn't teach me any of this. <laughs> um, all right, so we have um, we have started in on baptism. I won't go through a lot of review tonight because I want to have I want to have plenty of time with the Lord's Supper. So we started in on baptism last week, and we started in talking about. Um, baptism as a sacrament and um i haven't forgot some of these we'll hopefully get to some of those tonight too uh, i want to say something as we go into this session tonight that because baptism and the lord's supper are seen in such diverse ways within christianity uh i sometimes will talk about baptists or pentecostals or Presbyterians or Catholics, and it's a delicate thing because I don't mean to cast dispersions, but yet these are important differences, and I think that we can be together as brothers and sisters in Christ and admonish one another and be affirmed by each other, um, whereas the church in the past has not been so successful in doing that. You know, I, I love to hear the stories of of Lutherans in the Midwest who, you know, the biggest scandal in the whole family is that someone married a Catholic, you know, or vice versa, you know, and because you didn't, uh, you didn't rub shoulders there at all. Well, we're trying to do better with that, to have these differences without doing so in such condemning ways, which the reformers back 500 years ago did not do it in nice ways. They, they grew lots of, dis, you know, dispersions. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Um, criticisms, cut downs, et cetera. Luther was getting attacked from all sides and he sent the arrows back. Uh, and so, um, and, and it was, that was just kind of what you did back then too. It wasn't, we didn't, they didn't have the let's be nice to each other as much as we do today. So I was just reminded of this because I, I know I was making a comparison, I think, with the Baptist position. And we have a couple that is kind of a, a Lutheran and a Baptist together, and so the Baptist person felt, you know, pretty, you know, and my goodness, that's the last thing I want to do. So that's just a little bit of a um, disclaimer, <laughs> if you will, or just that I, I'm going to make an attempt to talk about these differences without, you know, put, putting them down. I think I was so much successful as I did that with baptism last week, but we're definitely going to be talking about different ways of looking at the Lord's Supper, especially tonight. 
So again, just to review, baptism is a means of grace. The other means of grace is Holy Communion. We believe that a sacrament involves an earthly element, a promise, a blessing attached to it, and um, it's commanded by Christ. There are lots of good things. Marriage is a good thing. Um, private confession and forgiveness is a good thing. Um, there are lots of good things. Come on in. That's all right. <laughs> Grab a chair. No, seats. no, there are. There's one there and there's one here. There's one. <laughs> no, there's one right there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we got some in the back too. So if other people come in even we're good. So you're good. We just we just did some highs and lows and we're moving into communion. So you're you're perfect. Um I hope you got the email that we switched. I did send an email out, but that we switched locations tonight. So um so uh that those three things marriage we think is wonderful and blessed by God, but we don't call it a sacrament. Um you know, uh, we have prayers that we do for people before they die, but last rites is not that like it is in the in the Catholic Church. So, so that's that's a difference. But again, so when we talk about Holy Communion, it's good to start with baptism because we're going to be similar to Holy Communion that God is actually doing something for us in this meal in this sacrament. So with that. Without further ado, we got the Lord's, the three names, Holy Communion, you're going to hear a lot of here in the Lutheran Church, the Lord and the Lord's Supper. Um, in the Catholic Church, Episcopal Church, you'll hear more Eucharist. Eucharist in Greek means Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So Jesus took bread, gave thanks. So it's called the Eucharist in some contexts. We'll use that uh, sometimes, but uh, we tend to prefer Holy Communion because it says what we think is happening. And then the Lord's Supper, well, it's the Lord's Supper. He He gave it to us. So so we'll, we'll start off with some texts. Um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. We don't hear about the Lord's Supper being instituted in the Gospel of John. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is certainly seems to be celebrating the Passover meal. It wasn't called the Seder meal back then, but it's what Jewish people today still celebrate in the Seder meal. And Passover used to be just an in-home event. So each home prepared the food, did everything. But then by Jesus' time, the Passover lambs were being prepared, killed, you know, um, in the temple. And then people would come and get their, their lamb and take it to their home and then have other things. So that's maybe significant. But in the midst of this meal that remembers the exodus from Egypt, Jesus um, does something more with this meal. And so as they were eating... He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant. Some manuscripts just have covenant, but. You know, so they debate about that one. It's kind of equal, equal weight, uh, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So right away, what do we see? Well, we see the Lord saying, do it. <laughs> um, give it to them. Take, take. This, that's the command. Um, and then what's the blessing? Forgiveness of sins. What's the element? Bread and wine. There is, I won't. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just get that on the table. Then we hear the Apostle Paul, who does not tell us a ton of Jesus' sayings. He, he, he's more about what's the significance of what Jesus did for us, especially in the death and resurrection of Jesus. But we do get some sayings. Like, did, did, what gospel is it it's better to give than to receive? 
That's a trick question because it's not any of the gospels, but the apostle Paul tells us that. <laughs> but we don't hear about that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but but Paul. So it's kind of a cool little detail. Um, nevertheless, Paul does tell us about the Lord's Supper because the Corinthian church is celebrating the Lord's Supper in not a really good way. <laughs> so he has to do some correction, but he refers to Jesus here and he says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not sharing the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not sharing in the body of Christ? Now, this is not where he says, um, you know, where, when Jesus uh, take and eat, this is my body, but Paul mentions that. But here, Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper. And so notice he he's saying, the bread that we break, is it not sharing in the body of Christ? Okay, so there's the verb, sharing. Um, some people, some ways, other translations say communing, um, part, uh, fellowshipping with, sharing the body of Christ. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Get some more up here with the small catechism in a minute. So all Protestants are going to look at this Bible passage, and all Protestants are going to look at the one that I just read. Uh, Lutherans are going to say what we think this is about is that in the Lord's Supper, we receive the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there's also life and salvation. And um, I love the language in our offertory hymn in the Lutheran Book of Worship. It's a foretaste of the feast to come. So that's some of the scriptures. Well, let me just put some more wood on the fire and then we'll 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 come back to some of the scripture. So uh, the big question is um, what do we do with this meal that Jesus gave? And what does it mean? Uh, and we're gonna kind of flesh that out from all lots of different angles from the the Protestant side the and there's lots of variations there and the Roman Catholic side. But really, it comes down to uh, us with a lot of the other Protestants. We won't talk about Catholics yet. Is what is the, how is Christ present? The mode of Christ's presence, if he's present at all. Um, so it really comes down to what does the word is mean? <laughs> I'm not, you know, we're not, we won't go into some, anyway. Um, what does is mean? For two, for 1,500 years, in the East and the West, the church taught and believed that this is truly Christ's body and blood. His very presence like um, something, a this I guess is the way you say it, is something where you have two things that that bring you one thing. And so body and blood, not that we are cannibals. The church never thought that, but that the real, the real presence of Christ was there in the meal. Yeah. It's worth noting that in John 6, Jesus does refute the, um, or, no, John 6 is about the crowd who interpreted that to be Capernetic, as in of Capernaum specifically. The crowd was in Capernaum in that it was a cannibalistic, right? That wasn't what Jesus was saying. It's referenced in John 6. You're about to mention Zwingli, who used that against Yes, I am. <laughs> because Luther said John 6 is not about the Lord's Supper at all. Um, he so in John six, um, what Douglas is referring to, Jesus says, "Unless unless you eat of the my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part in me." Um, and so, you know, what <laughs> is he talking about the Lord's Supper? And as he, you know, are we? Is he saying we're cannibals? Luther believed that John six that was Jesus's way of saying his word, his very presence, his, not his presence, his. His word, his proclamation, and and there's lots of um, Old Testament background to say 
that when you hear and listen, it's like eating. So we would say Jesus is speaking about the preaching of his word and about the historic Jesus and that he wasn't talking about the Lord's Supper because he doesn't. we don't hear about the Lord's Supper. Now, other reformers working with this is question go to John 6 and say Jesus must have just been speaking representationally, symbolically. And that makes perfect sense at a certain level. Like, because Jesus... Why would he be saying is? He, you know, Jewish people didn't drink blood and they do, certainly weren't cannibals and they weren't, you know, so the disciples must have known he was speaking symbolically. And so in John 6, where Jesus is says this hard saying um, and the, some disciples leave and they're all offended, um, you know, is he talking about just the revelation of his person that's in front of them and the preaching of the gospel that they're hearing? Um, or is he actually talking about the Lord's Supper in the Gospel of John, which Jesus does not institute in the, in the Gospel of John? So these are some of the interpretive struggles. So we dove right into this issue. And Zwingli, that Douglas refers to, was another reformer, and a Swiss reformer. Um, and once the Reformation started, this became a real issue of disagreement. And these princes that were going with the Reformation said, you guys got to get together because we can't have these differences among us. I mean, we got to be united against the emperor. So we, we got to get together. And there was a big meeting called the Marburg Colloquy. And Luther and Zwingli sat down to iron this out. And I think Douglas mentioned maybe last week that they pretty much agreed on most things except for this. What does is mean? Okay, so um, our Lutheran, like you know, Jim was alluding to earlier, we try and hold to that he said is, and he means is. This really is Christ in a tangible way. It's hard for our brain to get around that. We want to just take him at his word. We want to be literal. <laughs> we want to be literalists here. He said is. He certainly could have said this represents. He certainly could have said that, but he didn't. To me, this this is a really big deal. This is a big deal. I mean, that, this 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 just like say I spent the last ten years. There's I was missing something in the Lord's Supper. Yeah, and our church did it maybe once a month. Yes, uh, and I didn't know this. I mean, I'm just yeah yeah. And and they're doing it. So and, what's the difference? And I, cer I certainly never approached communion with any any thought like that. I mean, yeah. it, it it was. It, yeah. Christ, but, yeah. But it, 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 and, it, it was remembering. Right. Yeah. Remembering. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and this, this you know, is so, all, you know, it, to me, it's supernatural. And in the, in the same sense, wait a minute, now, I believe in the resurrection. I, I believe in the story of Jesus. Yeah. I believe in the virgin birth. Yeah. Can you and, and and this sounds like something Jesus would do. And again, the, the Lord's Supper, it seemed like, what am I doing? Well, yeah, this solved that problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Christ, Christ is coming to me. Yes. Beautiful. And and I, I just no, I mean, I'm just I'm just you're blown away. No, I am. I love it. I love it. Absolutely. Well. You're giving great testimony to a strength of seeing the Lord's Supper as a sacrament. Right. Um, and but we have to deal with these differences. And so you can say, okay, boy, I think I get where Lutherans were coming from. So, and I'm gonna try. I'm uh, we're going there. We're but I'm just I'm just getting some stuff out here on the table. So we like to say what is means by saying real presence. In, with, and under is what some other people said after Luther, but real, it, real 
present. Jesus is truly present. Now, how, how is that true? So, well, why is it important? So these are some things we can talk about. Um, we, we're, we've already started talking about the symbolic figurative way of looking at what Jesus said. Um, the emphasis there is on remembrance and um, um, these churches, well, maybe I should I just, do I have my thing up here? Let's see. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk some more about the, the, this figurative way of speaking. But in general, these churches don't see it as a sacrament. Jim, I think probably you and Sandy's church where you were before, they looked at it not as a sacrament, but as something we do to remember what Christ did for us. And do we do together to represent our oneness in the body of Christ, um, which it certainly is that. But we would say we see it as something more. So a lot of churches, your Baptist, Pentecostal, non-denominational churches tend to not see this as a sacrament. And I get that because they don't see baptism as a sacrament either. So, you know, it, it's kind of a way of looking at things. Um, uh, yeah, please. And at the end, he does say, do this in remembrance of me. Yes. So and it's more than remembrance, but he does say do he it. does say that. Now, here's a little exegetical stuff on that word. That word in Greek for remembrance is really strong. It's it's not a recollecting. It is. Have you ever talked about someone's who's passed away, and you started telling stories, and it was like they were right there. It's that kind of remembrance. It's not a, oh, yeah, I remember. It's it's like an intense remembering. But nonetheless, absolutely. And in fact, Dave, in a lot of the churches, like let's take a Presbyterian church or maybe a Methodist church, on their altar, it's going to even say, in remembrance of me, right? So that's their emphasis. We are going to celebrate that, emphasize the remembering part, um, but almost in more of the Old Testament where the prophets say, remember, you know, in other words, the covenant, the promise is, is preached again, even, you know, so the remem to remember what God has done to, is to preach that word. Um, so, so yes, remembrance is important. No question. Um, so how do we get into this? Uh, well, let's just say that when Luther was debating with Zwingli about the Lord's Supper and Zwingli, obviously we have a whole branch of Christianity that comes from that kind of reformation. Um, you know, think of it figuratively and they go to the gospel of John where Jesus does speak figuratively. I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. I'm the, I'm the, um, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the, you know, we have a lot of that, but in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus doesn't tend to do that so much. And so we want to take what he says in the context of what he said. Um, and then he just simply says is. He doesn't say this is like. And so we want to take him at his word. And then the passage I read from Paul, and there's other, and there's another in that whole section. Um, we're sharing in something. This is more than just a remembering. We actually, something is happening. We, something seems to be happening. He's talking about it in that way. Um, so here's the spectrum of belief uh, that that so that we can really get um, get our our whole conversation going here. So on one side, um, I'll just put these all up here. Um, you've got the Roman Catholic view. I don't know that this is the Eastern Orthodox view. Somebody would have to look that up. Uh, um, but the Roman Catholic Church, going to Aristotle, and you remember who Aristotle was? Aristotle was that great ethicist and philosopher, kind of theologian, I guess you could say. What would you? Well, how would you sum up Aristotle? Aristotle stole Plato's ideas and passed okay. them off. As all right, <laughs> all right. Well, that's fine. Well, so the Catholic Church goes to Aristotle and Plato, but you would call them philosophers, right? Philosophers. Yeah. Well, Teachers. I would say Socrates was a philosopher. Plato okay. was an orator, and Aristotle failed at both. Oh, <laughs> wow. 
Well, wow. there's there's that old joke from the Princess Bride. Ever heard of mm -hmm. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates? Morons. Morons. <laughs> that applies. That applies to Aristotle. <laughs> wow, you're you're even more I critical very, of Aristotle. Very opinionated okay. about Aristotle. Okay, well, he there's was a moron. <laughs> oh my goodness, my goodness, that just it offends me. Uh, 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 so no, Luther more wrong than Galileo about everything. <laughs> okay, I'm not as expert on on Aristotle. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to get your blood going with. I mentioned Aristotle. But Aristotle has this concept of uh, substance, so, something can look like one thing, but in substance be something else. And so the Roman Catholic Church went to Plato, Aristotle, whichever, yeah. to try and explain how the Lord's Supper could actually be Jesus. And so they came up with the fancy word. How many of you were, had Catholic background? We had a few, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it's called transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. So once the priest consecrates the, puts the words of Christ with the bread and wine, um, that bread and wine changes. It still looks like bread and wine, but it isn't anymore. It has changed. So the Catholic Church only uses wafers that have no crumbs because you would not want to get a crumb because that has changed now and it used to be that they priests would actually put the bread into your mouth so it couldn't one be dropped or you couldn't that back in the medieval times they thought it had special powers so they would kind of try and take it home and do all kinds of weird stuff um and of course they the for many years, they did not even receive the wine. Um, that's something Luther said. No, everybody should receive the wine and the bread. We receive communion both kinds. But that, that's because the Catholic Church, that's the way they explain the mode of Christ's presence is that there's this transubstantiation thing. They ring a bell in the Mass when those... That those words are said. I think they still do. Um, I like the Catholic view in this regard that they take him in his word and it's really a sacrament. That it is actually, but I don't need, I, I'll, I'll get in Douglas's uh, you know, camp here. I don't need Aristotle to explain <laughs> how Christ can be present. I just take him, I have him at his word. So this is where Luther, Luther and many of the other reformers, and in the Church of England, by the way, which, you know, was the Catholic Church, just Henry only want, it wanted, you know, his divorce and whatever, so he created his own separate, but he really kept all the theology of the Catholic Church going. But then the Reformation came to England, and then the kings and queens swapped, and then they killed each other. Anyway, they... But the Reformation, Luther's ideas did get into the Church of England and had a dramatic effect to the point where both the Episcopal Church today, which is the Church of England in the United States, in essence, um, the Anglican expression, um, and the Lutheran Confession is very similar on the Lord's Supper. We both talk about the real presence. We don't talk about that it actually changes. Um so you're probably wondering what a pastor who I met on the airport, airport or bus going to and from the airport one day when he learned I was, I don't know how we started talking pastors. We started <laughs> talking about Jesus anywhere. But um, anyway, so somehow he learned I was a Lutheran pastor and he was so upset about the Lutheran view of the Lord's Supper. He's like, that makes no sense. I just wish you guys would stop talking that way. It's just it's just a remembrance. It's a and I said, Oh, I'm so sorry you've lost this great gift. No, I didn't say that because I was like, hey, dude, chill out. Um, but anyway, so we're gonna zero back into this real presence and unpack it some more. But just so that you can see the spectrum, let's get everybody up here. We with the Catholic Church see it as a sacrament. So these these ones would would be sacramental. Now, also, the Presbyterians and the Reformed and the Methodists um, and the United Church of Christ, they also see it as a sacrament. But it's different. 
Um, I think they would say it's a sacrament. But they're going to say Jesus is present through the Holy Spirit. He's not bodily present. What do, you, what do we tell you when you receive communion in this church? This is the, blood. the body of Christ? The blood of Christ. You're not going to hear that there. They're like, no, 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 no. This is just bread and wine. But the Holy Spirit comes in a special way. This is Calvin. This is Zwingli. The Holy Spirit does come through the eating of the bread and wine, but it's just spiritual presence. So that's the way they take this is my body. That, that's a little different than what we're going to go to the non-denominational Baptist Bible churches, Pentecostal. They're going to say, maybe it represents or it's sim but but they would be nervous about even saying it's a symbol because a symbol is supposed to participate in the reality that it gives you but they're going to say remembrance only they might say they might be okay with the spiritual presence but typically not so a lot of times people forget about this one um that that it's either you take it as a sacrament or you don't but our Reformed brothers and sisters, and that's Presbyterians, Methodists, they, they all fall under the category of the Reformed Church. Um, they Methodists I, split off from Anglicanism. They do, they do, Reformed. but they are more in this mode. When we, let's say it this way, when we, the ELCA, the, yeah, so they are, it's true, Douglas, you're, you're absolutely right. They are different from the other Reformed. When the ELCA... Um, did our full communion agreements with various folks. Um, we had a, an agreement with the Presbyterian Reformed and United Church of Christ, and we had to do a different one with the Methodists. So you are right to say it's different. But I think that they have moved away from the Episcopal Church's intensity of belief in the real presence. I, I think that would be true. Is what do you, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, please. Where please. is um. Anglican. They are over here in Episcopal. Oh. Yeah, that's, yeah. The Episcopal Church, in essence, although they're, they're very different on a lot of things than the Church of England, but they are the Anglican expression in the United States. Yeah. yeah. So, this is the spectrum of belief. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, how sad that we're so divided on the Lord's Supper. Um what would Jesus think? He would say, well, I said is. What do you, you know? No, I don't know. Well, he would say that. Because going back to the Marburg Colloquy that we started to talk about, after Luther and Zwingli battled it out, um, Luther had written underneath the tablecloth the word on the table is. And he just flipped it back and he pointed to the word and he left. <laughs> <laughs> now you could say this is silly why even care why what's the big deal well it is a big deal and jim's beautiful testimony i think is why because if you let go of it as a sacrament then you're missing something i think uh, obviously i'm losing pastor please where did the word is come from yeah jesus no 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 i mean Oh, he I'm was, sorry. He wasn't there to talk to us. Entomology. Where, 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 did, it, where did it come from 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago? How, how, how did it arrive today? Greek, Roman, Aramaic? Uh, so we have it in the Gospels in Greek. What did, what, how Jesus said that in Aramaic, we, we, we don't know exactly. But um, all four Gospels are written in Greek. And there's a little bit of Aramaic preserved. Um, a lot of people think that Jesus spoke Aramaic. That's the kind of going view. Um, when I was in Israel, our our scholar uh, tour guide said, no, he spoke Hebrew. It was just a little bit different dialect. You remember a spot when they say, you're a Galilean? Well, how would they know he's a gal that the, the disciples were Galilean? Well, maybe they spoke like people in South Carolina. You know they're from <laughs> South Carolina, right? So, so, so there's some debate about whether Jesus actually did speak Aramaic, but Ar Aramaic was very related, um, and Aramaic has the word "is." You know, I mean, like not represent versus they have a different word for represent. So one has to assume that Matthew, Mark, and Luke 
preserve rightly into grief what Jesus said. Am, am I going at the question? Yeah. Yeah. So, so here we are with this difference. Luther was really worried if we let go of the real presence of Christ in the meal, in the supper, that we are missing a lot. That's why he made a big deal of it. And for many years, we've had this difference within Protestant Christianity and Roman Catholic Christianity. So, um, how is it possible? <laughs> That's maybe what your intellect is thinking. Mm -hmm. But before you go there, I want to go back to what I said earlier. We just want to take him at his word. And it's okay if we can't explain it. So this is. You don't need to do transubstantiation to explain it. And you don't need to let go of it just because it's hard to explain it like our other brothers and sisters do. Just take him at his word. He said, this is. So it is. You know, when you, you know, when he said, do this and remember, do this meal, remember me. And this is, and this is the blood. This is the cup of the new covenant. So, so just trust him. Um, that, that when you receive the Lord's Supper, you receive Christ. And all his benefits, forgiveness of sins, life in his name, all of that. So, but I know we're human beings. And so we need to just help us, help me pastor, get my head around it so I can just do exactly what you just said and trust. Beth, yeah. yeah, I'm through my time being a Christian. Yes. And in the various circles that I've been part of, I find that when we have to explain something, more often than not, we're dealing with fear. Right? Mm. So like when we have to have an answer, um, at least that's been true in my life when mm -hmm. I was in systems that were based in a lot of fear mm -hmm. with like, let's suss this out. Let's make sure we have an answer because somebody's going to ask you. And if you don't have an answer, you're not a good Christian. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where I've come from. Mm -hmm. And though this is a little weird for me, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Learning here, it's not totally uncomfortable because I've come so far. I've done the deconstruction work. I've, you know, Jesus was never gone from that. Um, and I'm really cool with mystery, but I guess I'm wondering how you would speak with somebody who feels that fear in this conversation, but is still open. Because I yeah. think that has to be addressed, I mean, in so many circles. And that actually answers the question that you initially had on the board when we all walked in, mm -hmm. like why people aren't engaging. That's a different conversation. I think there's a lot of fear. There is a lot of fear. Um, and mystery is, is uncomfortable because many of us in those really hyper reformed religious circles which i was part of for a while mm -hmm. do, does not do well with mystery which yeah. is why they've explained yes that's too simple yeah we got to get our heads around it otherwise we can't trust it believe it right yeah so it's not that it's not, we're not anti-intellectual but we are affirming there's some things that we may not be able to get we have to trust the word that's come in from the outside which and this is this is where Luther's first point is. Hey, if you can't believe that bread and wine can really bring you the real presence of Christ, he, he saw it as the same as trusting in the incarnation in the first place. You know, God became human. How can I can't understand that? Well, no, that's right, but that's what we're told and that's what we're proclaimed. But then just let yourself believe that this tangible elements also. And bring you the divine or God's transfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as I'm thinking about this, I, I, I'm thinking it's very similar to a parent explaining something to a kid that mm -hmm. a kid's just not ready to understand yet. Yeah. So as parents, we can tell our kids, no, you can't have a, a whole cake <laughs> right before bed or your, right. your tummy's going to hurt and you're not going to go to sleep tonight. Yeah. Um, and kids don't understand that. But if, if a kid can trust the parents, 
they don't they can't explain it yet but they they trust and they have that faith and it it seems yeah. like that's similar it i is. maybe can't understand enough to explain this especially to somebody who wants to understand at a very intellectual yeah. logical level um but i can say i have enough faith that someone who understands more than than i can explain said so i have that faith and and that trust yeah. so therefore nice. It makes sense. Nice. I like that analogy. I think that's really helpful. It also reminds me of the way I tell young people about the Lord's Supper. I say, um, do you like it when mom and dad tell you that they love you? Yes. But is there another way that they, you know, yeah, they give me a hug. And would you just like to have the, what if mommy or dad never gave you a hug and just told you they love you? Well, that wouldn't be as good. Well, there's the Lord's Supper right there. <laughs> um, in a, but but yeah, I, I love that, Jenny, because I think there is something to, we have to realize there's limits to our mm -hmm. ability to reason. We're not saying don't reason at all. Think it out, go for it. But you're going to run into uh, the limits. Mm -hmm. You know, on Paul and Romans, uh, He's wrestling with why the Jewish people didn't receive the Christ in mass. And, you know, he's and at the he, he comes up with reasons why. And at the end, he says, oh, but the ways of God are beyond what I can think of. I'm I'm just the clay. I'm not the potter. So he kind of like after he goes for it, he says, you know, yeah, Douglas. Yeah. So the in my opinion, yeah, and I would presume in in general in Lutheran's plural opinion, right? Uh, the Catholics and the Reformed, like the Presbyterian, et cetera, make the same mistake. They fail to distinguish between a theory and an observation. Mm. So are you familiar are you familiar with the idea of, for example, uh, mathematical theories or scientific theories? Not very. <laughs> so the <laughs> basic idea, which one. The basic idea <laughs> of a style. theory. Yeah. is you have certain observations you <laughs> assume, and then you can reason from that. Yes, okay. So in mathematics, you can assume pretty much whatever you like, and then reason from that, and then eventually you build up observations to get to those assumptions. So everything else is already true. So for example, the Riemann hypothesis is a complex, literally complex analysis problem that essentially says certain numbers that meet a certain property of a certain function, the Riemann zeta function, all lie on the same vertical line in the complex plane. We have no idea whether this is true or not. Right. Some of us have no idea whether it's true. Right. Well, if you have an answer, the Clay Institute has a million dollar prize. They'd like no, to but Douglas, go to your point, though. To, to so point. there are many, 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 many theorems in number theory, complex yeah. analysis, real all sorts of places that have been proven assuming the Riemann hypothesis is true. It's still an open question. We have no idea. Right. So, so how does that apply to the Lord's Supper? I'm getting that. I know. I just, I'm <laughs> getting Moving you along. Yeah. <laughs> so arithmetic as a... No, you're, you're good. Thanks. No, no. You're, 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 we're arithmetic as a whole is a theory. It's based on five fundamental assumptions, like the number one exists. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, as with all theories, you have a certain number of undefined terms. So in arithmetic, you have one is an undefined term. You have uh, the successor function, and that's basically it. And from that, we can define addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, whole numbers, integers, rationals, reals, complex, the whole shebang. We can build that up from two undefined terms and five postulates, which are just assumed to be true. Mm -hmm. So to apply that, we have to show that those postulates are true in whatever we're applying it to. And in the real world, we kind of picked those postulates to apply to the real world. So it works out. The same happens in Euclidean geometry, or actually Neo-Euclidean geometry. So I, same I, I want to get you to the Lord's right. Supper. Okay. Go. 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 It's, uh, the same, it's the same idea with scientific theories like uh, Darwinism, Neo-Darwinism, the 
the reason there's a distinction between Darwinism and Neo-Darwinism is because Darwinism made certain assumptions that have since been proven to not be true. Right. Neo-Darwinism doesn't make those assumptions. It's a whole thing. It's okay. really complex. Okay. <laughs> don't, again, don't believe everything you read again, on the internet. Right. Time-wise, I so gotta get to the So transubstantiation is yeah. a theory yeah. explaining how the function of the Lord's Supper works. Yeah. It is not invalid. It is a perfectly valid theory, but here's the problem. It presupposes certain things. I can't offhand tell you why, but it right. presupposes certain things, certain observations we could we could theoretically make about the Lord's Supper. Now, here's the problem. Those observations are predicated on Plato's mm -hmm. <laughs> very theory of observations. So, I promise this is going to be a short rabbit hole. Okay. Plato said that there are essentially two properties of an object. You have the essence and the accidents. That's actually essenza and accidents, but it, it doesn't matter. The point is the es you've got the essence of a thing, like an apple is an apple. The accidents is everything accidental to it, like its color, its shape, its size, so on and so forth. Plato was very, very much all about the theory of the forms the perfect ideal apple somewhere in the platonic realm yeah. or a chair. What makes a chair? This chair has five legs. A chair yeah. could have four okay. legs or three legs. Yeah. That's incidental to the chair. It's still a chair. Yeah. So the issue with transubstantiation is that it's unprovable. You can't actually right. make the observations it assumes because those observations, you'd have to observe the essence of the thing itself. That's what transubstantiation is transubstantiation yeah. claims is changing. But, but, essence. Yeah. but the argument of that is that it's the foresight of what has not become that we don't preserve. Mm -hmm. It's the forecast that has not happened yet. Yeah. Because that comes back to the argument of what you're talking about in terms of mathematics and which you gotta play by it comes back to the old testament versus the new testament. They're two completely different forms. Okay. So Thank you. <laughs> I, it's helpful to to come at this, but I've got a I got to steer us back to how is it possible that Christ can be and and this is all helpful, but I right. just got a theory is the it, point. It, right and exactly. the reason it's yeah. it was so problematic for Luther is because transubstantiation as a theory claims that the essence changes, but by definition of essence and accidents. The only way you can observe an object's essence is by way of its accidents, by definition. Right. So gotcha. the accidents, according to the theory of transubstantiation, have not changed. So just by observation alone, transubstantiation is fundamentally unprovable. Okay, good. That was Luther's problem. <laughs> right. Okay, good. Gary? In yeah. so many words. I got gotcha. you. Gary? I am... Um... I don't wrap myself around this too much because I just, I have faith. There you go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I have faith. Thank you. It is the body. It is the blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Because that's what he said. Right. There you and go. That's my faith. And that's perfect. And that's perfect. What I'm going to do now is try and help you make that move that you just made. Because some people can't, can't, do, can't go there because this gets in the way. Okay. Yeah. That's, so, that's your, your, and and your, and this your... conversation, it you know, kind of kind of goes to that. So, this is what Zwingli said um, was reality. He said, "There's no way that Jesus can be bodily, like tangibly present in the Lord's Supper, because where is Jesus? He's on the right hand of God. So, in a that he was talking about a spatial view of reality where God is way up there somewhere and we're down here. And the problem is how to get God down here or get us up to there. And so Jesus spiritually can be here, but not tangibly. Unless you want to say that your brothers and sisters are that tangible thing. But really, again, he's not here. The spirit is here. So tangibly, just the spirit. So this is Bingley's viewpoint. Um, so it's only a spiritual presence. This is, and then you get to the, the represents and you just go right down the, the way. Luther said, no, that's not the biblical view of reality. It, look at what the Bible says. Where is God? You ask kids, where's God? What do they tell you? 
everywhere. everywhere. Paul says, as he's talking in, in his preaching in, in Acts, we live and move and have our being where? In God. Um, and he's quoting some Greek stuff there, but um, he's he he affirms that God is everywhere. So the problem is not how to get God down here or us I'm up sure. to God. The problem is that, well, there's a different problem. Let's check, <laughs> check it out. So here we are. God is everywhere. The problem, though, is that we don't see God and we don't experience God. Why? Because there is a barrier. And that's sin. You know, you think about Adam and Eve when they they rose up against, you know, sometimes we say they fell, but they, they really rose up to be presumptuous and say, I want to be God. Um, and that brokenness came into the world, the sin came in the world. There was now a separation between us and God. We are not pantheists, which is a fancy word to say we're in God. We are in God, but we are going to say there is a separation between us and God. We, when I touch this table, I'm not experiencing God, but actually God is all over this table or whatever. Um, it's some native native religions, you know, you touch the tree, you're touching God and this and that. And I'm not belittling that. I'm just saying we, I can't go there, Doug, but it's, I got to keep going. No. We're going to make it. So, so um, <laughs> when, when we, when we do that, we, we are affirming there is a, there is a problem. And it's one that we can't get through. We can't just concoct, okay, I'm going to create. Like I hear so many people are kind of naturalists. What do they say? They say, I experience God when I'm out in the wilderness. Well, you do because God is creation. God made, not is creation. He made creation and God is everywhere. So I'm not saying you can't have a very powerful, beautiful experience when you're out hiking in the wilderness. But in truth, you don't know. This is my point. You don't know. Um, God is everywhere, but here's what good is an everywhere God to me? Absolutely nothing. Hmm. Really? Because I'm somewhere. I need God to be somewhere. Now, that, I, I, you're right. I, I pushed that a little too far, but I, I can't, where do I find the everywhere God? You know? You know, I'm in God, but right oh, in my heart. I, so, so th if if we if we let this be reality, and again, this is going to have its limits because we ultimately we want to get right to what Gary just said. We have faith in what Jesus said, but what we believe is happening in the gospel is that the everywhere God is breaking in to our reality. That's what the incarnation was. The Word became flesh. And moved into our neighborhood, be, dwelt, tabernacled with us. So what we believe is happening in the biblical story is God breaking in through our sin to reveal God's self to us. And we believe now that God has done that in word and sacrament. The word you've you've learned what the word is, Jesus, the message about Jesus and the scriptures. That's the word. Jesus, God has broken in. And in that word is are these sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, where God gives us a promise. So God is breaking into reality. So in all actuality, in the Lord's Supper, where's the right hand of Luther said, and this is he's totally Old Testament biblical, right on, the right hand of the Lord is not a place in the Bible. Think of Psalm 118. The right hand of the Lord is what? Triumph. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of God, sorry lefties, you know, but the Bible was a little bit, uh, you know, biased there, prejudicial there against you. But the right hand of the Lord, people knew as the string. Because, you know, not everybody that's true with our lefties here. But, you know, for most people, the right hand of the Lord is the stronger. So the right hand of the Lord was God's power. So so the right hand of the Lord isn't a place. Um, and so... You know, the right hand of the Lord is, so Jesus, in other words, can be bodily present, really present, tangibly present in the bread and wine, because he's already present there, but we don't experience that because of sin. You don't just go to the grocery store and pick up a piece of bread and say, oh, ah, thank you, Jesus, for becoming real to me. 
He said, take this bread and have this meal. And we believe that when you put Jesus's promise and, and words with the bread and wine, now the everywhere God, Jesus already in with and under the bread and wine actually comes to us. What God is doing, we believe, is becoming finite for us in the bread and wine, just like God became finite in the incarnation in Jesus. So we do see a, a link. So that when you come to the table, you can trust that Jesus is becoming somewhere for you. You know, you believe. Yeah. And 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 you believe it. So, so just like that, Jenny, you know, that, yeah, I can't explain to my kid everything, but I'm going to start. Well, you know, that are, we have limits here to this brain, but I want to, I want to make it, I, I do the, uh, what I do this simply to help your brain go. Okay. Okay. And then you go to the word. You don't believe because of this. You believe because Jesus said so, just like you said, Gary, just like you said, Jim. Um, so the issue for us is not getting up to heaven or getting God down here. That is actually seeing, believing that Jesus is in with and under the bread and wine, that he is with us. That is, that is what we believe. Now, just think about it. If you allow yourself to believe in the Lord's Supper as a sacrament, as a means of grace. Think about what Jesus did for us then. He said, you know what? I'm with you all the time. This, I'm in you. You're in me. You have the Bible. You have my word. You have other brothers and sisters in Christ. But every time the community gets together and has the Lord's Supper, I promise you, I'm going to be right there. Tangibly. Really. Really. And when he's there, what does he do? He doesn't say, you should have, you missed the mark, you. No, he says what exactly what he said to the disciples when he broke through the wall in the Gospel of John. They were hiding after he's raised from the dead. He walks right through. And what does he do? He doesn't say, Peter, you, what were you thinking when you denied me three times? And disciples, how come you all fled and ran away? No, he says what? Peace be with you. And in that peace is release and forgiveness and grace. And that's what he does on Sunday morning when we, after hearing the good news, we move to the meal, to the sacrament of the altar, to the Lord's Supper, to Holy Communion. You see, communing, Holy Communion. That's, that's what we believe he does for us. He comes to us. And so, my goodness, sometimes Pastor Bill or Jonathan may not hit the nail on the head, but you've always got the Lord's Supper where you can come to that table and receive that promise. So word and sacrament every Sunday. Lutherans used to do it once a month. The church, the church that I had in Lodi back in the 40s and 50s did it four times a year. You know, because they said it was so special that, you know, and that's fine, but doing it every week doesn't make it less special to me. <laughs> but that was, that was the thinking, you know, it, this is a very, and I get that. So there's pluses and minuses to, to doing this. But let me kind of just kind of get this out there. So implications, um, you know, just what I said, God is already present everywhere, but now that everywhere God that we can't get our hands on, just like the rays of the sun or something, actually becomes tangible so that we have something to cling to. Um, and Luther looked at the sacraments this way. When he, um, when he talked about baptism and when he felt assaulted by the devil or, you know, troubles of life, he would say, I'm baptized. God claimed me when I was baptized. And he can come to the table and say, God is, Christ is with me. He's, of course, he's always with me, but no, he's really with me. <laughs> I can experience him. Um, so so this, this is a benefit, I think, of looking at it. Um, that's the gift of seeing the Lord's Supper as a sacrament. The infinite God, God, 
the second person of the Trinity becomes finite for us. So, so what? One little note for you theologians about what something said about the natural then, and the natural world. Um, here's our spectrum again. But the one thing that unites the Catholic and the Reformed and even more radical Protestants is both say that the natural bread and wine cannot carry the real presence of Christ. The Roman church goes to Plato <laughs> and says it has to change. And has this theory that we've been mm -hmm. talking about. It has to change. I should also point out that spiritual presence is also a theory. <laughs> True enough. True enough. Good. Absolutely. Both are valid. The, the, both ways are theories to try and understand something. That That's true. Um, but both say that the natural can't bring you the real presence of Christ. Something, it either just can't do it, which is what the folks on this side say, or the Roman church, which says it has to change. We just say, no, you put his word together and the natural can be the host. The bread and wine actually can carry. So it's something is said about God's creation here. It's good. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. We're not pantheists where we just go out there and start hugging trees that, you know, or whatever. But because we believe in sin, we believe there's a separation. But we believe that if you put the word of Jesus with those elements, they can deliver. They can deliver Christ to you. Absolutely. That's what that, as I'm listening to myself, that's, that's what we believe. So, yeah, um, those do do that. So um, let me stop here and get your yeah buts or your how cool is that or your nuts, Pastor Bill, or whatever. Um, please. Yeah. Sure. When every time I have yeah, communion, I feel a real presence. Mm. I mean, there's a real presence. It's, it's, it's like something takes over me. Wow. That's what I feel. Yeah. And I mean, it, it strengthens my faith. Yeah, I, I look forward to church every Sunday. Yeah, look forward to listening to what you have to say. Yeah, but I love that communion. Yeah, because that's that's the that's the part where that I just feel tingly all over. Yeah, because I feel that I'm in God's presence. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, and I can go through the rest of the week. Yeah, with beautiful. Just no problem. Yeah, beautiful. And see, <clears throat> you're allowing the message and the promise of the Lord's Supper to sink in. Yeah. That's right. And that's it's, right. it's like I said, I don't, have to, I don't have to come up with any kind of a yeah. theory. Yeah. It's it's my faith. It's faith. Yes. In what the Bible says. It's yeah. faith. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You, you can't argue with what's <laughs> in here. <laughs> yes, you're right. Right. Uh, you can't argue with what is is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the yeah. proof. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. And and um, I I love what you're saying that you've mentioned faith. That is the essential element. That is, yeah. it is a matter of trusting Jesus's word that he promised that that that, that I'm understand. coming to you. This is my body. It. And in this in this is the new covenant of forgiveness of sins. Is this? Yeah, it's all there. Yeah, and and we as human beings want to try and explain it, but we have to just say. Okay, we'll do our best, but then we have to just, at the end of the day, go right to what you're doing. No, it's doing exactly what I want it to do for you, Gary. I can't spend any more time. Yeah, trying to yeah. You don't need to. Yeah, I don't feel like I need to. Yeah, yeah. And I get that. And that's what good. it is. It is what it is. I love it. Good. Other reactions, please. <laughs> you know, I want to say that Protestants and Catholics and stuff. They all get into these arguments about this sort of stuff. But then I, I wonder my point. Is my salvation based on this belief? That the sacrament has to be this way or this way or this way for me to be saved. Yeah. Does it need to be that? Right. And are you asking that question? Yeah. Yeah, let's yeah. throw it out yeah. there. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I no, faith your salvation comes from faith in Christ. And um if I don't think 
I, I maybe there are some Lutherans that might think this or Catholics that think that might think this, but I believe that uh, a Methodist who goes with the the remembrance only or the Baptist who goes with remembrance is going to be saved. Mm -hmm. That this is not a salvific thing. That for me, my concern is more pastoral. That this is a tremendous blessing, like some are saying, to my mm -hmm. faith and to other people's faith that I don't want them to miss out on. I, I you know, that I think a part of Protestant Christianity has missed out. Um, now, would Luther say that? Is not that that meant what Luther thinks is, you know, the, the thing, but he. He would, I think, he, I, I don't know what he would say. I don't, well, one, I don't think he'd ever say that he thinks he could say who's going to heaven and who's not. Mm -hmm. But he might say something like the, mm -hmm. the, the view rejecting the real presence of Christ and the supper is, is a huge, horrible, you know, thing. So, but, but, you know, that's where, that's where I kind of started out by saying, you know, there needs to be a way, you know, God is, if, if you believe God, the Holy Spirit is working in the church and that, you know, hey, you uh, Baptists, think about the Lord's Supper this way. And the Baptist is going to say, yeah, but you Lutherans, you're, you know, we need to have a conversation at the end of the day, say, you're a Christian, I'm a Christian, thanks be to God. You know, where I think historically the church has struggled doing that. Mm -hmm. So that that's my answer. Jen, yeah. I just have a comment that what you just said, I, I love that because, um, and it goes back to your question at the beginning yeah. of tonight um, about what, you know, causes people to step away from um, churches. And in my experience, which is a vast experience of religions, but um, one, it was that way. It was like, you had to believe this, you had to go through that, or you couldn't have the Lord's Supper. Yes. And for me, like having family come to visit, and it was just such a hard feeling that my family who hadn't been in that situation couldn't go to the Lord's Supper with me, you know? Yes. Right. Um, yeah. So... Just bringing that in. Um, yes, no. Tonight, I think. And we yeah. want to talk about that because when it comes to how do we, what's, how are you rightly ready to receive the mm -hmm. Lord's Supper? And you're probably talking about a, an expression of the Lutheran Church that does not commune people who are not members of that actual denomination. Very much so. Yeah. And um, and it. Is that and, the Missouri Synod? Yes. Yeah. 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 So also Wells. Um, yeah, Wisconsin Synod. Yeah, yeah Evangelical Lutheran. To Church. some extent, I believe NALC and LCMC as well. Is that? Correct? Don't think so. No? Yeah, most. Yeah, th these are other most Lutheran than, denominations. Yeah. There's so, a lot of smaller ones. The yeah, three biggest are definitely LCA, LCMS, and Wells, and that. Yeah, order. yeah. So, so yeah, you love what I'm saying because um, faith is what's needed exactly it's not excluding a certain you know religion or or denomination that's what i mean yes yes not yeah, religion, yeah, but not denomination. Religion, yeah correct so what we how we handle well maybe i should just go there since you your comment um yeah please i was just going to say i think jenna's jenny's exactly right because i think by excluding people in something maybe that they don't understand we turn them away exactly mm -hmm. that's so right. Yeah, being more open gives people an opportunity to then become believers. Right, learn and so help. this is this is the question. This is a very so. What is the right preparation mm -hmm. that someone needs? Well, Luther said it very clearly because in his day, the way you had to prepare was penance and fasting. You had to fast. You had to do all these things in order to receive the Lord's Supper. And he came down to bottom line. Well, let's see. Is this? No, yeah, uh, it's it's after this. Here, here. This is good. This is from one of his writings, the Babylonian Captivity Church. And take the greatest care to approach the sacrament, not trusting in confession, prayer, preparation, but rather despairing of all these, with firm confidence in Christ, who gives the promise. Exactly the way Gary talked about it. For as we have said often enough, the word of promise must reign alone here in pure faith. Such faith is the one and only sufficient preparation. So 
how we reflect that in our celebration of the Lord's Supper here is we invite all baptized Christians who have received, you know, with again, baptism, you're a Christian, you receive the Holy <laughs> Spirit, um, to join with us in this meal mm -hmm. where we believe that Christ is truly present. So is it going to hurt a press? Um, use it. Is it going to hurt my North American Baptist denomination Christian who comes if they have the Lord's Supper? Okay, I don't believe. Yeah. Okay, so I don't believe that's going to hurt them. Right. And we are rightly saying what we believe and receiving them into um, and say, hey, believe that Christ is present. Now, maybe that person believes Christ is present just spiritually and not mm -hmm. tangibly. Well, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to defend Missouri a little bit here, though, in just a minute. Mm -hmm. But but so we want to have a sense of what God is doing. We need to understand where that concern comes from. And it comes from 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul is dealing with a Corinthian church that is getting drunk and people are going away hungry. Some people have food, some people don't. It's mass chaos. And they think that they're having the Lord's Supper in the midst of this some people say it was an agape feast that we hear about in the early church. I don't know. But they they were practicing the Lord's Supper in a way that really upset Paul. And then Paul comes around and says, if you don't rightly discern the body, you are actually taking judgment upon yourself by receiving the Lord's Supper. So this is, of course, because Protestants all disagree about the Lord's Supper. We're going to disagree a little bit on what Paul means by this. What does he mean by discerning the body? Our Presbyterian friends and Methodist friends and, Pente uh, you know, probably Baptist, Pentecostal, um, United Church of Christ, these folks are going to say, when Paul says discerning the body, he's meaning the, the church. He's meaning the church. So don't, if you have the Lord's Supper and people are getting drunk and people are, and people are going away hungry, you're not you're not reflecting the unity of the body of Christ. So if you're not discerning the body as in the church and you're having the Lord's Supper back, Lutherans, and I think that there's, you can dial into some of the exegesis, the, the biblical study on this, say, no, he's saying you're not rightly discerning that this is truly the presence of Christ, <laughs> discerning the body. So... So that's where we want to say, hey, we want everybody who receives this to know we believe Christ is truly present in this meal so that they can discern the body, right? You know, they can commune correctly. There is disagreement about what this phrase means, but Missouri goes to the point where we got to make sure everybody's doing it right or they might be hurting themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Now, how does that come off? Um, you know, exactly like Siri said. It, it comes off as like, you know, it hurts when when people come who are Christian and they're turned away. Ouch, that hurts their conscience, that hurts their family, you know, and so I think that's really damaging to do that. Um, they also believe that it's an expression of our oneness and doctrine and belief. And so if you're not one with them in doctrine, belief, you shouldn't be having the Lord's Supper together. That's why Roman Catholic churches say you know, you got to be a Catholic to receive. Um, so, so yeah, that, so your comment led right into talking about what's the right preparation. Luther said, if, do you believe and trust given and shed for you? Do you believe that you should come to the meal? Are we ever going to get, we, we'd have to pre prepare till the cows come home, so to speak, till we're really ready to receive the Lord's Supper. I'm never ready. And in fact, I'm most ready when I go, I give up. I can't do it. Yeah, beautiful. I find it worth mentioning that the ELCA, LCMS, and the Catholic Church, and pretty much every magisterial, uh, um, magisterial and classical Protestant denomination provides for uh, provides in the liturgy for those who are not receiving communion. You can still go up, but you're yeah, yeah. Generally, it's something like we, this. You're supposed and, to hold your arms yeah, crossed over your chest you get a uh, to receive a blessing. This is a pretty well-known thing. Uh, that's what you do in the Eastern Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. the Roman yeah, Catholic Church, yeah. LCMS, Wells. The list goes on and on. Yeah, and, on. and that is what we do here for people who are not baptized. Now, yep. 
some ELCA congregations wanting radical hospitality, wanting to not, wanting people to, so it's, uh, I think it was Susan Bruce, I forget who said, but they said, no, people can eat their, and drink their way into the kingdom of God. They can start receiving the Lord's Supper and that will bring them into the faith. Yeah. That's a bridge too far for me. That's a bridge too far for me. Uh, clearly, bapti baptism is the way you enter the church and communion is the way that is nurtured. So I think we can say with very loving, caring, if you're not baptized, you know, be, come forward for a blessing. Talk, let's talk about baptism and so we can go there. Some congregations, though, have just practiced a completely open table, as they call it. For me, that's a that's a, a bit of a bridge too far. There but, is there yeah. is a great deal of just so miss, especially surrounding the sacraments like the Eucharist. Yeah. Uh, there's if you look through the old liturgies, there's every single detail is accounted for, even down to the way you're supposed to hold your hand, yeah, right, right over right, left, right. Yeah. crossed at roughly yeah. ninety degrees in front. Yeah, yeah. it's absurdly detailed. <laughs> Okay, but let me just say that, so these, the way we receive communion, though, reflects what we believe. Mm -hmm. So in the, our situation, we do it pretty reverently. Although some, sometimes we kneel as a way of showing our submission to Christ and Christ come, that, that, you know, what's happening. I like that. It takes a long time. Um, but but we do it reverently because we believe something really special is happening. We encourage you to go kneel at the altar after you receive, if you wish, or when you go back to say, you know, spend some time in prayer. So how can we help ourselves be present to, to, and I'm, I'm, we're just over time, get real quick one. What exactly is the purpose of kneeling at the altar? Um, it I, is just an act of reverence um, so heard... and, and worship and, and and humility, no, it's not just rep, it's a penance, like I'm forgiveness of sin. So I'm, I'm I've also heard that it's as um a sort of confession. Is that well kneeling as as it, it, it's penitential, let's say it that way. Um and so that's why during Lent we sometimes kneel, because it's more penitential season. But what I, I want to say that. is that how we receive it can help us be present to what's happening. You know, um, so we don't just say, oh, let's have communion today. No, we we put it in the middle of the whole worship service. We 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 hear the word first so that we're really ready. Sarah. Yeah. Well, I just say growing up Methodist, we rarely ever did communion. Yeah. And to be honest, my early memories of communion, I didn't think that much of it. But I have to say, since I joined this church and when I take communion it feels real different yeah Be, yeah and you not know, a surprise there, i mean i i feel like gary was saying it's like okay this definitely i'm feeling a presence here wow. that's that's awesome so so you're experiencing what the promise is in this meal which is beautiful and makes my day to hear that but but of course in fairness to our methods because they don't believe it's a sacrament they don't take it that way right and they don't they do it more casual, let's say. So what how what you believe about the Lord's Supper reflects, I'm sorry, how you practice the Lord's Supper reflects what you believe about it and vice versa. So well, yeah. I do I do like what you said earlier that um in the church, as long as you're baptized, anyone can take it because it kind of ties in what we were talking about earlier is that why don't people come to church? Well, there's so much arrogance mm -hmm. or something, you know, that's right. just part. I mean, right. religious denominational arrogance. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's like, I've... less God's coming down and talk to me. I don't think any of us have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like a holier than thou. Attitude yeah. Very that, much so. That we got to be careful about, don't we? Yeah. Trying to find God. Yes. As, yes. As we do. Yeah. Please, Dave. Um, this is not to get to the arguing what is is about. Right. But it seems like in the command of the sacraments that um, when you say take and eat, it's more of an invitation, less of a, it could be take it or think, like an invitation mm. as opposed to go and baptize, like a lot of mm. action things. So mm. take and invitation. Mm. But... Mm -hmm. 
moving beyond that, then to Penny's point about the importance of this and the whole scheme of salvation or being saved. What if I never went to communion? Yeah. For whatever reason. I mean, not yeah. um, just, but yeah. I don't want to walk up for example, or whatever. Yeah, but, right. Or or maybe you were a part of a Christian tradition that never even did communion. You know, it's not going to separate you from Christ. Um, I There's one spot, I forget where it was, but Pete Luther was asked about this, the, the question you just asked is more often asked about infant baptism. What if a child isn't baptized? What's going to happen to them? Because we believe in original sin, so they need baptism. So, you know, whereas other Protestants don't, we talked about that last week. But um, you, you, I, Luther said somewhere and, and that God doesn't need sacraments. We do. Mm -hmm. We, you know, so faith is clearly what justifies faith not our necessarily our faith but our faith in christ what he did our our believing in the faithfulness of christ and what he did that's salvific if you will um but we sac jesus gave sacraments for us to help us believe so so yeah if someone doesn't receive communion for whatever reason that's not going to separate them from god um, and I would say the same for a baby who's not baptized. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't, you know, just because I under, that doesn't negate. I know I'm kind of dancing <laughs> on that one because I believe babies need to be baptized and should get baptized <laughs> because of what I believe about baptism. But that's, I'm not going to put myself in God's shoes and say, you can't save this person because they didn't receive a sacrament, you know. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, that's that's just God's thing, not our thing at all. So that that's a great question. I I know that we're way over. <laughs> um, how did this happen? Time went by fast. I, this is this is what I want you to get. I want you to get what Jim and Gary so beautifully said tonight. That um, letting the Lord's Supper be, I think, what Jesus says it is. That this is His body, and this is the blood of the new covenant. Um, just think that the infinite God who's everywhere, who's almighty, humbles God's self in the second person of the tree and becomes present in with and under bread and wine when we put Jesus' word. That God says, okay, look, you're looking for me. Shut your mind off for a minute and just come here and hold out your hands. I'm there. And man, when you're hurting... When you've had a rough week, when you've had awesome, God just wraps you. That's what I want you to get to. Okay, let me close this with a prayer. Thank you, God, for this great conversation, and thank you for the meal. Thank you for the mystery of it. Um, it is a sacrament, and but but also thank you that you've given us your spirit that we can trust and take you at your word, and that you've given us this hug, this tangible encounter with you where we indeed um, have the forgiveness of sins and life in your name. Continue to be with us as we go forward from here um, and continue to learn and now start to move into praxis and worship and, and um, let it continue to be helpful. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good work. We Like I said in my email that you hopefully got today, if you're not getting emails Give the office a call and say, hey, I'm in the foundations class. I'm not getting those emails that Pastor Bill keeps talking about because you should. You should be. Um, but, um, yeah, so we are going to have to tack on at least one more class. I know some of you have only to the end of October, but you, you, don't, you can, the recordings will be there for you. So, all right. And thank you for letting me go a little longer tonight. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, two minute thing. Okay. About um, is it if it for me? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you're saying how we can't observe God because we're separated from it. Yes. That reminded me of an old device for trying to find a 